I'm Dr. Ellen Kenner, and with me is Dr. Ed Locke, and I want to wish everybody a happy Valentine's Day. And this is the book we wrote, and this is what we're going to talk about today. It's the book we wrote together, The Selfish Path to Romance. Whoa, what a title, huh? How to Love with Passion and Reason by both Dr. Edwin A. Locke and myself. And I want to ask you, first, Ed, welcome. Thank you. Glad to be so, here. Yeah. So what, I mean, we wrote a whole book on romantic love in, how would you, just, if someone said, well, what is love? Love can't, love's just a feeling. It can't be described. What is love? How would you answer that? Well, we had a nice definition in our book, a strong, emotionally intimate relationship between consenting adults that combines an intense valuing of a partner on the deepest level and the enjoyment of sexual pleasure with the partner. That's our definition. So it is an emotion, though. The, yeah. When, you know, I think of when I met my husband as Harris. So when I say Harris in, in this show, uh, when I met him, oh, my God, that, you know, I, I had other dates. And when I met them, it was, uh, no, this is not working. And when I met Harris, right away, I was charmed. I was infatuated. I was blown away. And I was so attracted to him on the first date. Now, obviously, we've written in our book that um, you can't go by first impressions all the time. And many people listening know that. But, you know, tell me about it. It's an emotion, Ed. What, it was an emotion. It's like, I, whoever this guy is, I'm loving him. Well, Ayn Rand made the point, which is very important and which many psychologists don't yet understand. Emotions are the uh, brain, brain problems aside, are the consequence of subconscious value judgment. So you perceive something, but your subconscious makes all kinds of connections. And it may start on the first date with looks, which is fine. I mean, it's fine if you like the looks of your partner, but there's a lot more to it. So if you want to get a bigger picture, you have to go beyond that and have a lot of contact and discussions and meetings with your partner to find out uh, uh, the bigger picture of just looks, which means their values, their interests, their goals, their aspirations, their view of the world, uh, their view of uh, um, you know philosophy, uh, whether they're religious or not religious. So there's a great deal, the way they process information the way they make choices. So there's a great deal of conscious activity re uh, regarding uh, love and including your figuring out why you responded to the person, let's say on first meeting, the way you did, but then supplementing that with lots and lots, lots of more information the repeated conversations and meetings, seeing each other in different situations, doing things together and putting the pieces together gradually and especially looking for red flags. Mm -hmm. I just read in these uh, Dear Abby columns in the paper about uh, this lady who started on a date and had about five red flags yeah, you know, good ones too. And then he said, Let, let's go out. I said, okay, we'll go out. And they went and ordered dinner. And then he, he left after dinner and left her with a bill. Oh my gosh. <laughs> right in line <laughs> with the red flags. But she right. didn't register the red right. flags. Right. So, so you can have you can have immediate turnoffs. Yes. Often which yeah. are valid. Right. But you can have immediate turn-ons, which require a lot more validation. It's right. right. Easy so you to, to get rid of a jerk, but it's a lot more to get developed with somebody who you've really got to know got to know well. So if I go back to my example with Harris, Ed, um, when I first met him, he was different. I had dated other guys, it was a blind date, and he came to the door to pick me up. And he 
as opposed to other people who came to the Dodge to go out on a date, they were all dressed to the hill, dressed to impress. Mm -hmm. Harris himself, he was in dungarees, whatever. He brought his puppy along with him, which was this huge dog mm -hmm. that was in the front seat. He, uh, he just... He played classical music, but in the car, but it wasn't a put on. Mm -hmm. And he just was so generous, like opening the door for me. He just, but he wasn't putting on airs. I think that was what I was picking up, but I didn't have the words for being it. Genuine, being genuine. And then we went out to eat on our first date. And to prove that he wasn't trying to impress me, he said, order whatever you want. It was a, a little Italian restaurant, uh, mom, and, mom and pop place. And when I ordered steak and the bill came, he just, <laughs> just handed the woman a two for the price of one coupon. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just thought, he has no embarrassment. I would be mortified to take someone out on a first date. I love this guy. You know, he just, and over and over again, he was honest, true to himself. And, but I didn't have, I didn't even know at that point that I needed to introspect and put into words why I was responding so positively, why his playful sense of humor captivated me. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as you've said in that book, you get to know a person over time in layers. And that's what you're talking about now. You need to see them in stressful situations. Or in, or in social situations. Go they ahead. put on one uh, uh, personality with you. And when they get to others, are total BSers and, and make up right. things and false flattery and things that contradict what they said to you in order to be accepted. So that's a very telling revelation to see that they act the same way in terms of their values with everyone where they play roles right they can they and so and that's the point that uh you can't just go on autopilot with that initial emotion mm -hmm. of infatuation that emotion needs to be unpackaged mm -hmm. and you ask yourself why am I feeling what I'm feeling and if your first answer is I don't know I just feel it mm -hmm. I don't know is the beginning of a thought process mm -hmm. it's of course mm -hmm. you don't know at the beginning because you're beginning to introspect and then you draw it out of yourself well what yeah. did he do that I liked or what did she do in, in the case you know if it's and, and people can be better than they appear because maybe yeah. they're shy and nervous and you have to draw them out and then when you get to know the real them uh, which they will reveal eventually you find they're better than you thought they were. So it can go both ways. So that whole idea of finding the right person, um, it, it takes a lot of thinking and a lot of active thinking. You don't want to be passive in that. Um, other tips, Ed, for finding the right person. I know you said that my father said that unlike most fathers in the 90s, growing up in the 1950s, he said, Ellen, make sure you sleep with whoever you're planning to marry to make sure you're compatible. And, you know, it's like, dad, <laughs> but uh, he was right. And, yeah. you know, but you don't necessarily I want to rush that, right? Oh, no, no, no. A lot of guys want to get the woman into bed right away after a big fancy dinner. So well, sometimes the woman wants to get the guy yeah, into sometimes. bed. Right? But there's no yeah. need to rush. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you know you're going to be around, right? And and I think it's it's good to develop friendship first. And I know my daughter uh, found her partner online, her husband, and they just were going out as friends. It was a friend site where you could meet people in the area mm -hmm. and go out as friends, and they just really connected, yeah. and it became more than friends. Oh, that's good. You know, people yeah. online can lie. You know, these yeah. dating sites, people lie all the time about their attributes and traits in their lives. I mean, I'm amazed to read stories about it. So you want to find out, okay, what are they really like? Let's, yeah. Let's go further. And it's great if it starts out well. Let's keep going. And you mentioned um, deal breakers. It's very easy to break things off. 
maybe not for everyone, but if somebody's dishonest, if you see that they're dishonest with the waitress or with a friend, or they tell little white lies, you better believe they're going to do it with you. And there's more than that if they're, if they get, a if they have a temper on first date. Right. You know, like, like criticize the waitress. Also, I think, uh, speaking for myself, although I'm almost 84, so I'm not starting from the beginning, but right now, I would be really, really lose interest fast in somebody who was anti-vax. Because yeah. to me, defying the vaccination is really not defying the government, it's defying reality. Yeah. Defying the laws of biology. And I find that really, really eternal. So for you, that would be a deal breaker. If Absolutely. I said, right. Right. Or if you were dating somebody at this age and they said they didn't want to get a vaccine. And there are many things along those lines really? that religion for me would be a deal breaker. Yeah. And for another person who's religious, it would be a deal breaker in the opposite direction. They may a not deal maker. Yeah. Right. right. And so you want to be compatible and, and you want to find out, do you want children? I mean, that's a huge decision. And if you're with somebody and they don't want children and you love them, but you say they'll change their mind you're making a big mistake because they may not change their mind or if you force them into having children, that's a problem. I'd like, Some, I'd like, to, I'd like to see whether they're earning a living, assuming they're not, right. out, of, assuming they're not, out, they're not in college. I'd like to know if they, if they say, well, I haven't worked in a while because I'm between jobs, big red flag for me. Right. Like, but what, if what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. If, what if are you doing about it? Yeah. And if they, and if you heard what they were doing and you had some, and you could see that they were really having a hard time finding a job, yeah. um, then right. that would be one thing. But if they, um, I know my daughter once dated somebody and he, he just wasn't looking even, and she was supporting him. And that was, that didn't work. If they ask so, you for money, yeah, you start dating, big red flag. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, another problem is another deal breaker. If we just focus for a few minutes on deal breakers is um, repression. Someone that doesn't speak Ed. If I said, you know, how are you, honey? I'm okay. How was your day? It was good. What are you thinking? Oh, nothing. Yeah. If they can't carry a conversation to me, that's a big negative. Uh, you know, are they so shy? They can't deal with another person. Or are they mentally uh, ill in some way? Or are they so repressed they can't connect? Uh, so that's a real issue. Um, maybe they don't learn, they don't know anything about the world and they don't want to know. So to me, that would be a very boring. Finances can be big deal breakers, which you alluded to here. If someone's not earning anything, bad manners and habits, mm -hmm. just uh, real. They they have very poor hygiene. They, you know, I've I've gone to dance classes, Ed, where we change partners. We're in a group lesson, and some of the guys, when I go to dance with them. One this week smell like a cigarette, and it's like I get mm -hmm. into perfect dance position because I'm trying to get away from it, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, others are just greasy or sweaty. It's like one said, "Oh, I come right from work," and it's like I can tell you need yeah. a shower. And by the way, smoking to me is another deal breaker. Yeah, I would never be close to anyone who smokes, but both because it smells, because it's anti-health. Yeah, it is damaging your health. Yeah, and, and that is very really good health. And, so, I, uh, and, I, and we may be very rare in this, Ed, because there are many people that we know that smoke too or that drink. I am a non-drinker and we have a friend who came to visit us once and we went to just uh, another Martin Pa restaurant. I'm big on Martin Pa restaurants. And we sat down and the waitress said to him, what would you like to drink? And this person is a bodybuilder. Um, and he looked at her and he said, you see this body? He said, I, this is my Mercedes Benz. I'm not going to pour that fuel into it, <laughs> meaning alcohol. So, you know, but the, most people drink socially and, you yeah. know, a sip here or there is not a problem. But if you, I've worked with enough people who have had an alcohol, alcoholic in their family or, or who themselves are alcoholic, and it's not a walk in the park. 
you know, I don't drink either. It simply doesn't agree with my physiology. It doesn't yeah. make me feel good. So, uh, but my wife drinks sensibly, like wine. Yeah, I'm that happy with that. So, right. so, so yes, good. but what you say, say you have an alcohol problem, that's a big red flag. It's a big that often, flag. It's very hard to get out of that for many people. Right. Very hard. Right. So to turn to something else, you open our book. I'll show the book again. It's the, the Selfish Path to Romance, How to Love with Passion and Reason. It's your example that we start with. And it's my husband's favorite example in the book. And it's the example of a woman meeting somebody. She's divorced. She has children in a museum. And if you want to talk a little bit about that, I would love to to talk about psychological visibility what is that yeah well people when we talk about this i think a lot of people think it's approval that's not at all what we mean by this visibility is acknowledging the other person's good traits and uh, yes. and characteristics and the function of that is enhanced self-awareness for your partner. You're responding to your partner's ideas, uh, looks, you know, you know, not being fanatic about it, but their look, uh, appearance, nice appearance, their decision making, their thought process. You're giving them enhanced visibility for traits. Now, Aristotle said that uh, friendship is another friend, a friend is another self. Mm -hmm. so it's quite different in meaning than approval. If you can't validate yourself, yeah, the other people validating you, you've got a problem with confidence. Yes. Yes. If you have self-esteem, you already know you're okay. Yeah. You don't need somebody else to tell you you're on, but but that's different than visibility. So let's say you have uh, serious intellectual interests. And they think I'm so delighted to talk to you about these because I can't find friends to talk about ideas like this. I'm, I'm so happy to have you as a friend and we'll see where that goes. So that's, that's visibility. It's different right. than saying, oh, your ideas are the best ideas I've ever heard in my life. You're just so brilliant and perfect in every respect. That's fawning. It doesn't ring true. So it's you have Ross and Olivia meeting at the beginning of our book, your example, and she's got her children and she's showing them around to the museum. And he is, uh, he overhears her and he goes over to her and he says something to the effect of, um, I, I love the way that you're instructing or teaching your children. Yeah. And, you know, it was gentle and she just is, and you're, you seem like a lovely lady. And he wasn't, it wasn't in a flirtatious way. It was just naming what he observed. And she was just uh, to her core moved by that because he was naming something as a single parent, she, her husband wasn't around as a single parent she doesn't always get that feedback that she's doing well with her kids or that, uh, you know, nobody else is seeing her in the museum to give her that feedback. So that was, and she was divorced. So she didn't get that visibility. And in a good romantic partnership, you want that mirroring. I think we've talked about this before that with visibility, um, you, if for regular visibility, just to look at your body, you look in a mirror, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And you see yourself and you can see, oh my gosh, I need to lose a little weight there. Or oh, I really look good. You know, I'm putting on some muscle. Yeah. I've got some biceps now. <laughs> you can see that, but you don't get that feedback from a mirror of your character. Yeah. And that's what your lover or a romantic partner, or even a good friend or colleague gives you. They give you that feedback that you are... Um, of some character trait of yours that that they admire and they and uh, love or like and they tell you and that's the mirror. Yeah. So, uh, so I call this the invisibility cloak. Go ahead. <laughs> people, people 
give you none whatsoever. No visibility, no visibility where it's just, um, it's, so I, was, I wanted- I was, I was on one more thing. I was online with a friend of mine, a colleague from another country. Yeah. And we were having a discussion that we got into philosophical issues. And it was about how it's nice women are born now instead of two centuries ago and they could get respect. And, yeah. and, I, and we had a long discussion of this in Aristotle and history. And, and I said, you know, it's really nice to talk to somebody. I can talk about ideas of this kind with you because there aren't very many. She said, oh, thank you. It's so nice to talk with you about issues like this. So this was, I call philosophical visibility, which isn't the only kind, but yeah. it was great. It was really good for me and good for her. Right. Well, you talk about intellectual in the book, intellectual visibility from a partner, sexual mm -hmm. visibility. That's what sets romance apart. Uh, you know, I love it when Harris is very attracted to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's it's very nice. And ethical, even, ethical visibility. Yeah, I, that was a very difficult situation. I can't believe you spoke up and you yeah. were honest. And yeah. I admire that. And that... Or even I was at the gym the other day and during my cool down, I have a personal trainer. My personal trainer pulls out his phone and he said, oh, my God, he said, you've got to read this. <laughs> and one of his other clients had told him that that he was the best. She's lost 20 pounds. She wants to take him to Minnesota. Soda, I sound like I'm from Rhode Island now. Soda. Uh, back to uh, Minnesota with him during the summer when she goes back to Minnesota <laughs> so she can yeah. have him. And he said, that makes me so happy. That is my reward. Yeah. And he doesn't speak English. He's from that well. Um, so he said, I said, that's more, that's worth more than the money. He goes, oh, yes, that visibility is worth more than just getting the paycheck. I mean, the paycheck's important, but hearing that people appreciate you is really important. And all visibility doesn't necessarily involve romance. We give our male lady visibility. Yeah. But visibility is helpful in a lot of other ways. But if we go back to romance, and, you know, where it's about, we're talking about Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day is every day of the year. It doesn't have to be singled out, yeah. but it is fun. I mean, I loved getting the Valentine cards when I was in grade school um, from everybody in the room, especially Paul. Paul, I had a crush on. Yeah. <laughs> I still have that. I mean, my sixth year, in your, I still have that card someplace in the house. Yeah. Of Valentine. I must have been, I don't know, seven or eight. In a romantic partnership, that, that doesn't happen automatically. And a lot of times couples get into a phase that I call we're used to each other rather than still really cherishing each other and valuing one another and giving one another that visibility in words. And it doesn't have to be in just in words. We talked about uh, Gary Chapman's five languages of love. I don't know if you want to talk about one or two of them, you know, ways to communicate. Um, but there are also uh, the positive love languages was, as you mentioned, giving encouragement, giving recognition, showing appreciation. You can give small little gifts. You, they don't have to be, you know, a car in the front yard with a big bow on it. It can be just small, fun gifts. Like Harris once left me a note on my car after I was working a full day. And when I got back into my car, I said, I have a pizza at home for you. And it was small and it was wonderful. I felt so connected um, to spend meaningful time together. A lot of couples grow apart. and to deliberately make an effort to either have movie night, Harris and I have dance night, ballroom dance, just about every night, but ballroom dance. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just doing something, whether it's taking a walk or playing a sport. My sister plays pickleball with her husband. Darned if I get that one, but <laughs> pickleball. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So um, they're giving gifts, um, helping out around the house. A lot of 
a lot of undercurrent frustration in relationships comes from, I'm doing everything around here. She makes me do the dishes. She makes me make the bed. Usually it's the opposite, you know, the woman saying, but you know, I have to do everything. When you help one another out, when you make it collaborative, it's fun. And, and again, some partners want to be in charge of certain household things. Oh yeah, oh, I, Harris can have the garbage, Ed. He can have they, they want to be in charge of the dishwasher completely. Yeah, yes, I mean, and that's fine. You have a division okay. of labor. Exactly. For me, with finances, when I was so busy in school with my clinical practice, with teaching Ed, I had no time to do the finances. And so Harris did everything and I was totally in the dark. And then I thought, this is not a good situation for me to be in. I can't, you know, I need to know at the time we were using QuickBooks or Quicken or, um, and I need to know how to use that. So I just asked Harris, would you be willing to train me and I will take over for a while. Mm -hmm. And I did that and I kept it and I really enjoy doing that. And he's fine with having turned it over to me so we can change over time. Um, go ahead, Ed. In big decisions, though, such as buying a house or a car or an expensive repair project, it really should be joint. Yeah, yeah. It oh, any done, big decision, it any should big be always decision. done jointly. Yeah, you don't come home and said, you say, honey, I bought a new house for us. <laughs> <laughs> right. I bought a plane. I bought an airplane today. Is yeah. it okay with you? <laughs> and it's, yeah. I oh, in, I uh, wanted Delta. I didn't want Southwest. I sold half our stocks and bought, uh, what do you call it, Bitcoin. Uh, right. Without right. telling you, because I decided uh, it's, bad, it's a bad thing to get in like that. You got to do that jointly. You want to um, encourage each other to pursue their values. You don't want to have one person always living in the shadow of the other. Sometimes that happens. Like if someone goes to med school, the other person's the breadwinner, but then hopefully it will switch. When the person comes out of med school and is a doctor, they have enough money, the other person can pursue a career, but there needs to feel like it's fair in a relationship. Yeah, I mean, people have to have their personal interests. Right. And you've emphasized that you're an individual first. You know, to say, I love you, Ayn Rand has said, one must first say the I, mm -hmm. be able to value oneself. And that's not narcissistic. Mm -hmm. How do you make yourself lovable? And should you even need to? I've had people that have told me they should love me just the way I am. This uh -huh. is the way they married me. They knew it in advance. What the heck's wrong with them? They, they can put up with me. Yeah. This is who I am. It's like they're telling me just because I yell and scream or just because I am a slob, you know, what's the big deal? If they, if they married you when you have outright flaws and you and they both agree, you both earn that problem. But let's <laughs> say uh, we're, we're out of that thing. So uh, to be loved, you, you need trust. So one of the traits you need is honesty. You don't have honesty. You don't have trust. If you don't have trust, how can you have intimacy? You're hiding right. stuff from each other. Right. So right. That's, that's, you know, really important for what do you do if you don't have integrity? It means you state certain things as the right thing to do and you never do them. So that's a lack of integrity. Or yeah. you value earning a living and then you stop working and sponge off your spouse. So, so, uh, so it's a betrayal of your character and even giving up your character if you don't have ethical principles that you act on. So that's one aspect of why love has to be earned because why should you be loved for nothing? Right. And, and certainly the first thing that we love them for is they have good values. That's not the only thing. Honesty, integrity, being productive, having a good sense of justice, of fairness, knowing what's fair. Um, they they need to have core virtues, and mm -hmm. and that's where I, uh, you can look at yourself. I've always said I always feel like I've had the attitude toward myself is that I'm always growing, and that you grow in a romantic partnership 
wonderfully if you work collaboratively. You learn about yourself. You learn about what works, what doesn't work, because that. Um, and the question that I usually that I've asked myself, but also have used, have asked many times that people could think about is would I, Ellen, like to live with a carbon copy of myself? What would drive me nuts? What would I love about myself? And uh, one person, I, I asked that question at, when, at one of the talks I gave, one person came up to me afterwards and said, thank you so much. He said, when you asked that, I pictured being my partner and being in the car as the passenger, I speed all the time and my wife doesn't like it. And um, I realize I would not like to live with a clone of myself and be the passenger in that car because I don't like speeding. I think I'll slow down, you mm -hmm. know, they raise their awareness. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the type of change when you see it for yourself firsthand. Oh, I don't like this about myself. I would like to change. That is a win-win situation. And you make yourself more lovable for one person first, you. Mm -hmm. You'll love yourself if you're not always speeding on the highway and cutting in and out of cars. You can learn stuff like that from communicating. You know, you're supposed to not say that. It really makes me nervous when you're doing those kind of things. You know, speeding through yellow lights when you're 150 feet from the intersection. Yeah. And that kind of yeah. thing. And so you can listen. And if they have a good argument, then you act accordingly. Right. You want right. to grow together intellectually. Uh, you want to grow together emotionally. And you want to grow closer together by communication. That is important. You need to communicate constantly. That's one of the points that we make in our book. Again, our book for those of you tuning in later, is that this is Dr. Edlock. I'm Dr. Ellen Kenner. And we wrote the book, The Selfish Path to Romance, How to Love with Passion and Reason. And it's inspired by the ideas of Ayn Rand. So um, you talk about communicating constantly, Ed. How does that help in any partnership? Well, first of all, you really need to be able to carry a conversation in general. I can't yeah. tell you how many people I know. Some of them are relatives. Yeah. If I don't carry the conversation, they're dead. They're silent. It really, it really annoys me that, okay, I'm going to try to carry it. I'm really sorry no one else can. You know. And so you, if you can't initiate conversation with your partner, it's going to be boring. That means you have to be intellectually active about the world yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, you're going to be silent uh, among each other. Right. And many couples do that. They say, that, and they even have a term, companionate relationships. There's no more sex in it. And you're companions. You're like good friends. But even companionate relationships, you want that communication constantly. And that, can, you, that can be valid if, depending on your age, too. And you build interests together. You want to grow together in a way where you at least have some couple's interests or hobbies or um, conversations that you, you both enjoy together. You use the metaphor in our book of that romance is like a garden and you need to water it. If you don't water it, the weeds are going to grow. And it's, and it's not just a garden that's, um, I'm elaborating on it now, but that's stagnant, you know, pretty flowers, you add to that garden, like this, Harris and I do ballroom dancing, and he just signed up for a personal trainer, and I went with him, and I love having a personal trainer, I work harder than I ever worked before, those biceps I was telling you about mm -hmm. before the mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I feel like this isn't even the body I knew a few yeah. months ago, but we both grow positively together and we have a lot of fun at the gym. Um, so you find activities. Some people like watching movies together. Some people, uh, you know, we've mentioned things, but you grow and you add new things. You, If you love travel, you can travel together, new adventurous places. Yeah. I mean, what you said is important. You don't have to do everything together. You know, right, right. you've got to have some things you like to do together, and that's important. Right. Otherwise, right. you're living parallel, parallel lives if you have nothing that you like to do with them. 
Right, exactly. So um, I want to get to the main, the most controversial thing about our book is the title. Mm -hmm. And there's one word that leaps out or certainly did when I told my parents this was the title of the book, selfish. So when people hear that and to carry around a book, The Selfish Path to Romance, it looks like I'm training myself to be a narcissist my way or the highway, uh, um, arrogant, manipulative, uh, conniving person. Is that what we meant? <laughs> Save no. us. <laughs> no. no, we don't. Uh, and think of the opposite. What, is, what would be a, self, a selfless romance? Yeah, a real yeah. selfish romance. Yeah. Valentine, mean, yeah. you have no value yeah. in relation to the other person. You don't care about yourself. Selfish. You have no value. You don't care what happens. But and, you, yeah. And then you go to the other side of that coin, which is equally yeah. bad. Altruism. Altruism means otherism. It means you live only for others and not for yourself. And wanting something for yourself is immoral. Yeah. So you left with a choice often of, so which is it going to be, altruism or narcissism? And the lethal combination in many marriages is the man's narcissist mm -hmm. and the women's the altruist. Right. And I've seen it flip too, where the woman is the, 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 the man is the, the weak one that just whatever you want, dear. Right? What, happens it, in this kind of, what happens in this kind of thing? Uh, what happens is alienation. The narcissist gets bored with the worshiper because that's not enough. Why should yeah. I care about worship from somebody who has no value? I don't want worship from more people. Yeah. You know, to get more worship. And then for the altruist, it's, so I'm doing all this. So what am I getting in my life? Nothing. And then that leads to typically depression yeah. and a lousy sex. Because well, uh, I'm supposed to give him pleasure, of course, but I don't get any, but that's my job. You know, that's, so it's a deadly combination of two sides of the wrong coin. Right. And you said, you've used the phrase, ego is the matter. It's mm -hmm. that you want both partners to value themselves, as we mentioned earlier, to say, I love you, you must first be able to love yourself, to value yourself, to see the good within yourself and to grow and to repair things that you want to improve, uh, to improve things you want to uh, be better at. And um, the egoism a jerk comes, uh, that means uh, egoism for two, that's my French hunter, <laughs> that was your phrase, that for both partners, they both get what they want out of the relationship. It's mutual. They, it, we, Ayn Rand calls it a traitor relationship. It's you give me a back rub, I give you a back rub. We both win. It's not a lose-lose scenario like it would be in the other, the, the narcissist with the altruist. No, that's, that's right. So you want to support your other your partner's values and support them in pursuing them and they want to do the same for you. Right. It doesn't mean all the time you only do what you want or they only do what you want. Sometimes you separate and do separate things that you like. But uh, as an essential aspect of your relationship, you support their values and they support okay. your values and don't resent them unless you're you know, spending your time with another partner or doing something dishonest or ignoring them. Uh, okay. So sometimes people have to do things on their own and that's okay. But you you want them to pursue values. But let's take sex. If you're selfish in the way we mean, right. you love giving your partner sexual pleasure. Yes. Because you love them. Because yeah. they're a value to you. So the idea of saying, I don't give a damn what they're feeling. I don't want to get mine. It's ridiculous. Why are you married to them at all? So you want them to have sexual pleasure. It gives you pleasure. If it doesn't, something's wrong with your marriage. And they want to do the same for you. But it's not a one-way street. So they you might enjoy different things in sex. 
and within reason, within personal taste, you you go along, but not something that makes you horrified, but something uh, that's okay. And then you take turns. So uh, so self sex has to be selfish in the right way. Right, and Otherwise we one partner's about, got nothing. Right, we talk. We have a whole section, a whole chapter of that on that in our book, on how. That's where communication comes in. What feels good for you? What doesn't feel good for you? What would you like done a little differently? What's the best time of day for you? Uh, when would be a good time? Because people, you can't, I once had someone say to me, if I marry someone, this was a young guy, if I marry somebody and I want sex in the middle of the night when she's sleeping and I turn over to have sex with her and she doesn't want it, I'm out of there. He said, I want my, my wife to be able to want to have sex with me anytime I want to. Perfect it's narcissist, like, right? What? Perfect narcissism. narcissism. <laughs> Either that or very young and he doesn't get it yet. <laughs> He's got yeah. some learning to do. <laughs> but then can you imagine the woman in that situation? Oh my God, in order to keep this partner in the middle of the night, I'm in stage four stream or I'm dreaming or I'm in stage four deep sleep and I got to wake up and do it. It, be, it immediately becomes a duty, an obligation, a disvalue for her, and she will avoid it at all costs. She'll have a headache. I have yeah. a headache. If, She'll... If, if someone's avoiding it, uh, usually the woman, uh, you have to ask some other questions. Or, or is there a problem in your relationship elsewhere? Right. Sometimes it's not just mechan you know, the sex. It's that relationship. Uh, why on earth would I ever want to make love when you didn't help me carry in the groceries today? Well, I wouldn't make it that narrow, but it, <laughs> when you don't care about anything about me except for sex. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. That, yeah. In that case. Yeah. Right. But even small little grievances, because that not carrying in the groceries usually stands for many Symbol times. Symbolic. Like it's yeah. symbolic. I get, yeah. yeah, it's the easier thing to talk about, but you can't hold grudges. Yeah, you, know, you did one thing and you're out of sex for a week, so that's not the way to do it. But it's got to be that you value each other, you have the kind of relationship you want to please each other outside of sex, right? So, so this is a is normal the, part of the relationship. So, um, what type of things, uh, undermine sex in the culture? What ideas are out there that ruin romance, intimacy, emotional intimacy, and, and sexual intimacy, Ed? Well, one of them is, I don't know how common that is now, but for decades and hundreds of years, uh, men were ignorant about how you give pleasure to a woman. Yes. No. What do you do? They just said, I'm going to stick it in you. And that's going to be it. They didn't even know what the clitoris was or yeah. what a role it has. Uh, they right. didn't know about touching and other stuff. They didn't know about mood. And so there was, an, and, a, and if you're a narcissist, it's justified because they're supposed to catch out for you. But, but you have to understand that, you know, sex is a two-way street and people have their own preferences and you want to please them because you love them and you like the relationship, but if you, uh, but if you think sex is just, you do what I say goodbye. What is it called? Slam bam, thank you, ma'am. Yes. Uh, it turns it turns sex off completely. Right. Right. And then of course the narcissist says, "Okay, I'm going to find it elsewhere," and then undermining trust. So it's a negative slope all the way. Right, right. So I'm also thinking, I mean, there are other things if you're very, there are a few other things that can undermine intimacy that the reason we're bringing these up is because you don't want to do these, you want to bring back intimacy in your life and liberate yourself, if this is an issue. Uh, one is spectatoring when you're, when you're in the process of making love, you don't want to feel like you're on the in the bleachers, watching yourself saying, oh, 
are my boobs big enough? Does he like them? Is this, you know, am I moving in the right direction? You, you don't want to be an internal critic. You want to enjoy the pleasure. So that's one point. Another is um, obviously you can be very tired, fatigued, and you need to address that. You, you might not want sex then, but, or you might be afraid of getting pregnant if you're in that age range and you, you've got a, some guys have a terror, obvious, uh, understandably huge fear of the woman getting pregnant and they may not be ready for marriage. And that, you know, that's a, <laughs> that can be a deterrent. So I'm going to go back to selfish and just say a few words to myself, Ed, that one of the problems I saw with couples in therapy over and over and over again, I would see, say the deepest problem that I saw was that one partner or the other, or many times both would say, I, this again, couples therapy, I feel like I've lost myself in this relationship. There's no me anymore. It's all about her, the kids. It's all about her in-laws. It's all about her work or his work or his golf or his tennis or his buddies, his drinking buddies, or it's all about, um, you know, there's no me anymore. I feel- okay. What? Altruism. I feel invisible and they have lost themselves. They say, I do for everybody else. I do for my kids. I do for my in-laws. I do. And there's, I don't feel like there's, I don't, I've lost myself. And the whole focus is you never want to betray yourself in a romantic partnership. You need to know how to be true to your values and lovingly honest with your partner. You need great communication skills. And to, to do that, um, that is what we mean by when we say the selfish path to romance self-valuing, self-nurturing, self-esteem for both partners. It's that egoism a deux. And we, do, we don't mean being mean, rotten, and conniving, obviously. So that, uh, that said, um, that that's one of the biggest killers in romantic relationship, that not knowing how to value yourself and not knowing how to communicate. So I wonder if you have a few words yeah. on that. Well. Uh, let's talk about dual career couples, which is okay. very, very common now. Right. Is, and you have kids. This is a very potentially stressful lifestyle. It's a very hard. You need to talk about making the right deal with each other. How are we going to do this? And there's a lot of potential plans that you can use. Like uh, the woman might want to stay home temporarily when the child's young and then go back to work. Uh, there's uh, flexible schedules. Often it, it's the need for a, a daycare some days or some of the some of the time on a given day. Mm -hmm. You need to work out chores, like uh, uh, maybe you want the man more involved. And he said, "I got a lot of stuff too." Uh, you know, doing doing the yard work is really time consuming. You could get somebody to do that for you. Uh, how about cleaning? You can hire a cleaning lady or man or cleaning service. And so it's time and money trade-offs. Yeah. And you're buying your life back. If you, you're mm -hmm. buying time and time is your life. Yeah. Um, so you need to work out preferably ahead of time how, how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. And it's very, uh, can be very stressful and the more kids you have, I don't know how women with three kids and is in a stay at home, even stay at home, yeah, can do it all. Yeah, my daughter does that. She's got twins and I don't know uh, how to do it. She's now starting to work again in a five year old, six year old now. So I'm sure uh, she's worked out. Oh. They they have a great relationship. Yeah. She just they communicate, and they have what my Harris and I have, and probably you have too. Um, that a delightful sense of humor. That when things get stressful, there's a way to look at them in a fuller context, and almost you can ease the pain by not increasing the the stress level. You know, oh, if, you brought up humor. I'm glad yeah. you brought, it's really important. Uh, 
humor is not right if you use it to disparage everything. No. Oh, the human race is so stupid. Aren't we all madmen? What are we doing on the planet? You know, that sarcastic type of humor. That's not what I'm talking about. Talking and that, about, will, that will corrode any relationship. Yeah. I'm talking about good natured humor, yeah. fun, cute, good natured humor yeah. to lighten the mood. I'm yeah. all for that. that yeah. I think that you're not, you're not laughing at important values, you're laughing at silly things. Right. right. Or things, maybe I like, I like reading the things in the newspaper. I say, can you believe this person did this? And it's, it's not anyone I know, so this is really silly, you know, that kind of stuff. Right, uh, right. No, or, when Harry? Or yeah, reading in the, in our paper has the funnies in it. Yeah. And uh, I call in over, I said, I said, Kathy, I can't understand this, this particular guy, that, this particular one, this, this today, could you explain that to me? And then we, she said, oh, I know what he means. Then we can laugh about it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, or no, can, it's really we, funny. Or we can share a particular comic from that day. Say, come on and look at this one. I love this one. You know, good, good natured humor is what you want. Yeah, so one of the things that um, Harris has a delightful sense of humor. When he teases me, it's never sarcastic. I always feel better after I feel prettier or sexier or <laughs> playful. So it's he's got this delightful charm about him. Um, and, so the humor is wonderful. And you mentioned coming home at the end of the day. Think about the atmosphere that's in your home. You know, when you're around different people, sometimes it's just bad energy. I mean, it's not energy. It's just, you know, that they're moody. When you walk into your house, when you go out on a date with your partner, does it feel light, playful, enjoyable, or interesting, intellectual? It, are there values there? Or does it feel like, oh, I'm going to walk through that door and it's going to feel like there's a tornado or a hurricane or someone depressed, you know, just dark clouds there. You can even use that analogy of the weather. I've done that. You know, what is the weather like when I'm with this person? Well, this is the wider she is, be sure to pick your friends carefully. Yeah. And they can yeah. mess things up. They're not really good friends. And also right. be very aware of the role of relatives in your life. Right. I mean, certain relatives can be very un obnoxious and unjust. And you have to you have to decide what relationship you want. And if your spouse is being uh uh, pestered and insulted by a relative of yours, you got to stand up for her, or vice versa. It's a woman. You got to stand up for your spouse, right? Not so, not not your relative. Stand up for your spouse first. So that is the theme throughout. Ed, that's the the title of our book. It's stand up for yourself. Be true to yourself. Be honest. It's my uncle once said. I'll always live with one person, myself. So I want to make it a very nice home to live in, like your own mind. So he's, he loves reading scientific. He's a scientist. He loves reading scientific Americans or, um, you know, he's, he, he loves educating himself on all topics. And Harris and I do that too. But you make your own life interesting, your own internal life. So if you're alone, you have that to turn to. You are an interesting person. Um, and one quick note, I know we're winding down on time, but even in the best relationships, each of you will want and look forward to a little private time. The other may be going away for a conference or something. And it's nice to experience yourself as an individual too. Yeah. I believe in private time, absolutely. As long as so, it's not most of the time. <laughs> no. Right, time. right. And Harrison, and people, people have different needs for that. Harris and I are together most of the time. It's still nice when I leave and he has some time to watch a movie he likes or to go for a walk or I, you know, I'll do Zumba or exercise and he'll do something. So it's not like you have to do everything in lockstep, obviously, and you can have private time and enjoy that without guilt. Yeah, absolutely. As long as you're not betraying the other person, private time with another oh, partner is yeah. a problem. Yeah, not having an affair, anything dishonest, no, or no. spending money you didn't agree to, but 
Just, right. And one of the way you want to do tennis and they don't. So you, right. right. So you play. So there, there are a lot of things we didn't cover in the book that's that are in our book. Um, we we covered a lot. But we did not cover uh, communication skills. This is the book here, uh, res, you know, resolving conflict. And we we it's a wonderful book. It's got very short chapters with exercises to apply the skills. We have everything from uh, what is what is romance. How do you make yourself lovable? How do you find this your soulmate? How do you know it's the right person? How do you keep the romance going over? The decades you can make it thrive rather than go on an autopilot and have that I'm um, used to her I'm used to him Neo, have, and you, you brought yeah. into the book I language yeah that you can I language is so important right as opposed right. to e language you have a problem. Right. New language. You do this. You always do this versus I'm frustrated right now. And the other person will say, what's frustrating you? You can talk about it. Yeah. So you can read about that. Uh, we talk about how to make your relationship thrive and cherish your partner, enjoying sex, uh, resolving conflict. And we even have a section in appendix, how to part ways and start over if you cease being soulmates. And we do that very respectively respectfully so on valentine's day i know we're winding down um i with if you're with if you're tuning in very late we're about to end the show i'm dr ellen kenner i'm a clinical psychologist and i have a radio talk show the rational basis of happiness and ed Locke and i wrote this book the selfish path to romance how to love with reason and passion inspired by the ideas of ayn rand and ed is world renowned world renowned for goal setting theory and he's one of the most prolific authors and writers that I know and he was my mentor even though he didn't know it I'd listen to his classes um, and love them and uh, and I just want to thank you Ed I love this project and I love the book that we ended up and with. my pleasure you know everyone doesn't know this was an eight what an eight-year project yeah it was a long project it was an eight-year project because there was so much to say, and we, and we learned so much doing it. Yeah, uh, we, so, did. we did. So, so we feel this really, really, really covers it's the topic, right. which most right. books don't. Right. So you can get this on Amazon.com. The first chapter is free. You can also go to drkenner.com. Ed, I don't know if you have it up on your website. You want to, we, we need to, to um, stop. It's on um, my web website. and. And of course, and, if you like the what's book, your website? Just give your Edwin website. Edwinlock.com. E-D-W-I-N-L-O-C-K-E.com. And I'm drkenner.com. And I'll end with a quote from Ayn Rand and then let you say a final word, Ed. It is one's own personal selfish happiness that one seeks, earns, and derives from love. And I wish people a happy Valentine's Day. And Ed? Uh, Ayn Rand would uh, ask the question, would you die for your spouse if you're an egoist? And the answer is yes. If they're an irreplaceable value to you and you had to do something to save their life, you would risk your life absolutely to save them because you're an egoist. Yeah. They're an irreplaceable value yeah. and you love them and life wouldn't have the same meaning if they left. And if you have to risk yourself, you would do it. So that's how profoundly better, love, better, love profound. better to love for live for with them every day. So that won't come up. Yeah. Live with yeah. them and so, yeah. So the advice is just embrace your partner. I mean, embrace yourself first and find couples activities that you enjoy together and enjoy not just a happy Valentine's Day, but a happy Valentine's year and a happy Valentine's life. <laughs> <laughs>